All right, it looks like it's 4 p.m., uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks to Hack Miami for having me, and thanks to all of you for coming. This talk is Intrusion Hunting for the Masses, a Practical Guide. First, a disclaimer. Opinions expressed in this presentation are my own. I'm speaking for myself, not for GE, nor anyone or anything else. I am David Sharp. I started off in IT and systems programming about 20 years ago, and have worked in a variety of roles over the years. I've spent the last 10 years focused more on IT security. For the past four years, I've worked for GE CERT. Why am I here? I believe that we are finding fewer and fewer high-end APT intrusions across the board. To be clear, I'm talking about the private sector, not the military or intelligence service spaces. I believe this general downward trend in detections is spread across all industries and is worldwide. I am not saying there are fewer high-end intrusions. I am saying that we seem to be finding a much smaller percentage of them compared to just a few years ago. Why the drop-off? Have attackers lost interest? In my experience, that's a no. Are we generally all better defended? Are our systems becoming impossible to breach? I think that is a no. Harder to breach, yes. Impossible, no. Have we become less effective at finding intrusions? Maybe. For the sake of discussion, let's pretend there are five skill levels of targeted attackers, assigned school letter grades ranging from A through F. Hacking RSA to abuse tokens to enter a target, A game. Stuxnet, A game. Using exploitation, C2, lateral movement, and exfil techniques from five years ago, D game. Spearfishing the same way you have for the past 10 years, F game. Frankly, we all struggle with finding PhD level attackers bringing their A game. Many of us struggle with attackers at the B or C skill level. Many have success finding attackers using D or F game tactics, but is that good enough? I think there's been a general upward migration on the attacker side into the A to C game level that has at least partially blinded us. Maybe we have hunted most of the D and F game activity to extinction over the past few years and haven't caught up with the A to C level offensive side of operators yet. The purpose of this talk is to share several, several simple and easy to do yet effective techniques to find out intrusions at all those levels from sophisticated A through to humble F. If you take some of these ideas back to your, back to your own organizations, <clears throat> a significant percentage of you will find intrusions when you return home. So what's working for finding intrusions these days? That, in my view, breaks down into two broad buckets of activity. You're good. No, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Alerts from lists of known bad things, indicators, generated mostly from automated network or host detection systems. That approach is still effective and essential, but isn't what we are covering here today. Matters involving financial loss often include alert employees somewhere along the line throwing a red flag. I'm talking more about hands-on keyboard intrusions in this talk. Another approach is by hunting, or manually looking for signs of, po of possible badness across broad data sets. This, is a, this will be the focus of our talk. Now, manual intrusion hunting can, and should where possible, lead to new forms of automated detection. Data stacking, a term I first learned about from a Mandiant presentation, is another key to success in, with intrusion hunting. Data stacking basically refers to ways to massage a data set to get the abnormal and interesting things <coughs> to bubble out of the normal data. The concept of data stacking will make, more, will make intuitive sense as we work through the practical examples in this talk. So what about data science? You hear a lot about that. Where does that fit in? Data science is great for a broad spectrum of problem domains. Data science techniques can certainly help inform better detection and hunting practices. However, in my opinion, the simple element of time is, in many cases, the most sophisticated data science model element that pays off for much of a certain problem set. Not high-end math, not complex statistical techniques. Time, just a simple correlation between two or more related events is often enough. Think about the hammer toss malware from last year, where you needed to see the C2 action between rogue accounts on Twitter, followed by activities to certain subdomains on GitHub within a certain amount of time. I also don't use complex visualizations or graphing. Visualizations certainly have their place in many problem domains, but I, don't, I haven't found a way to graph some enormous data set to help, to help me spot a, an intrusion easily. We're aiming for simple but effective. So what does work? First, know thy data. Know what data is available on the systems you are collecting from or what you can derive from what is present or happening on the system. Know what each element or field in the data truly means. Second thing, know what badness looks like and check for signs of that in your data set. Be a student of intrusions, both yours and everyone else's. 
have an unrivaled knowledge of your search intrusion and incident history as far back as your records go. Read vendor reports of how APD actors operate and how specific intrusions played out. Read court indictment papers for people charged with hacking. Be an omnivore and study everything you can get your hands on to broaden your, your knowledge of how real-world intrusions play out. <clears throat> if you're wondering what the blue arrow is all about, I use a blue arrow theme in these slides. The way I see things, we all get arrows fired at us on a daily basis by attackers. This talk's purpose is, is to give you some arrows for your own quiver to help, to help you fire back, to help you better defend yourselves. <clears throat> we will cover 12 practical examples of hunting in this talk. These 12 ideals were purposefully selected to maximize your chances of finding intrusions for, intru for all intruder skill levels from A through F so that you can, one, help reduce damage to your organizations and customers, two, raise your adversary's cost of operating, and three, general generally speaking, better protect your grid. So let's get started. First, shim cache and AM cache. If you only act on one thing from this talk, this is it. What is shim cache and why is it valuable? Basically, shim cache is bookkeeping data that Windows automatically maintains to support application compatibility. Shim cache is used in Windows XP through <coughs> Windows 7 on the client side, and from 2003 server through Windows Server 2008 on the server side. As a side effect, shim cache gives us a record of what processes have been run on the Windows machines for a time span that could potentially span back months or years, depending on the age of the system and how it is used. If an intrusion happened two days ago, two months ago, or two years ago, this might be your best shot at seeing that. A convenient and easy one-stop shop to see how to see much of what has been ran on the system over an extended period of time. Many intruders of all skill, letter, skill levels, including some of the best attack teams in the world, still don't clean up shim cache or AM cache, despite their being meticulous about cleaning up otherwise, so play that to your advantage. How can you get shim cache data flowing back for analysis? You can either run this Python script from Mandia directly, the link is on screen, if you have a suitable Python runtime available on all your Windows machines. Or you can make a Windows EXE out of the, out of the provided Python script using something like Py2EXE and deploy that out. If you pull the resulting data back to a central system for processing, you're looking at around 100 KB per machine. You should aim to collect and analyze shim cache or AM cache from all of your Windows endpoints both client and server. But servers are the sweet spot. Why? Servers, in my experience, remain the number one initial entry point for breaches, especially internet-facing servers or other servers in DMZs. Windows clients are also important due to the prevalence of targeted watering hole attacks in recent years, and to a lesser extent, targeted spear phishing. On, moders, on modern Windows OS versions, Shimcache can, can be anywhere from a few hundred entries long on a brand new or lightly used machine to 1,024 entries on a typical production machine. Shimcache records look like what's on screen. Shimcache records break down as follows. The first field is the last modified timestamp. This is not when the process last ran. It is the last modified timestamp from the file's MFT entry on the file system. For newly dropped malware that has not been timestamped, this field is useful. If it is timestamped, then you at least know something ran, maybe just not exactly when did it run. Next, the last update field was used only on Windows XP. This was more useful for telling when something last ran. That field isn't set on modern Windows versions. Next, the full path field shows the location of the binary on the file system, so this is definitely a good one for our purposes. The file size field is only set on Windows XP and Server 2003, not anything newer. And the last field is the execution flag. This is a binary field set to true or false. I haven't found this field useful for hunting, so leave this one alone for now. Consider an example. Here's some NTFS entries or time stomped. These, these July 2010 dates made no sense given the age of the system and stood out in the data set when sorted by timestamp. Another thing that stood out as suspect were the file paths. Does anything normally run out of C colon Windows fonts? Looking across your entire shim cache and AM cache data set, you will see the answer is no. The last few commands by themselves could be harmless normal IT or user activity, but in this context also could be scanning or recon since they were grouped so close together in time. For your reference later, here are several links to more information about shim cache. 
Oh, by the way, I have a, I don't know if this conference has a way to go distribute the slides internally just to, to the attendees, but at the end I'll give you my email address and you can see if you want this, you don't have to jot all this stuff down, just email me and I'll shoot it back out to you tonight, the slides. All right, it's a lot to write down. There's a lot of detail on this talk. Now let's, let's break down AM cache, shim cache's replacement. Shim cache was replaced by AM cache starting with Windows Server 2012 Ford and Windows 8 Ford. AM cache is still in use with Windows 10 and Server 2016. AM cache serves the same purpose as shim cache, but has several more useful fields for hunting. How do you get AM cache data flowing? The source file, amcache.hpe, is locked on running machines. This registry hive file is small, so an in-use copy of the AM cache file back for offline processing should work. Then you can run the original author's Python script directly. The download location of that tool is on screen. With AM cache, you have more useful fields to stack and mine. A breakdown of the available AM cache fields is on screen. There are more fields at AM cache for the attacker to accidentally signal their existence. Some of these fields get set by the compiler or linker and may not be simple to fake, or might be easy to forget about. There are more fields to leave blank when they should be filled out, a lot of ways to make mistakes and give away an intruder's presence. Note the SHA-1 hash field. This is useful to help filter out legitimate binaries from the data set. Now, what should you look for in the shim cache and AM cache data? Stack this data thoroughly and see what bubbles out. Remember what I said before about attackers neglecting to clean this data up, so spending extra time here is worth the effort. In general, you're looking for any tools to support any of the key actions commonly taken across intrusions, reconnaissance, privilege escalation, credential dumping, lateral movement, data collection, archiving, and exfiltration. At a minimum, check for signs of credential dumpers. Sequences of recon activity, net commands, pings, use of scan tools clustered together in time. Look for archivers being ran. RAR, RAR is still the big one, and consider 7-zip now, too. Look for EXEs running out of abnormal locations on disk. Look for things being ran with short file names like 1.exe or w32.exe. Here's an excerpt from AM cache from a breached machine found using the AM cache tools timeline feature. AM cache has a dash T argument that you can use to generate a timeline. I had to edit a lot of fields out of the AM cache output to fit it onto the slide so that you can see an example of what malicious activity might look like in timeline form. There are normally no EXEs present or ran out of the top of C colon users. There's normally not a file named avscan.exe in C colon Windows System 32 either. So that is why these records bubbled out of the data set. <clears throat> I strongly believe a high percentage of you will find an intrusion soon using shim cache and AM cache only. Here are some links for additional information about AM cache for your reference later. Next, the second highly effective arrow for your quiver. This might sound counterintuitive to some, but antivirus logs still are still one of the most productive places to hunt for signs of an intrusion that might be in progress and have been for years. In my experience, just under 20% of all targeted intrusions involving Windows systems have AV fire somewhere along the way. You are missing an opportunity if you don't mind your AV logs. You are missing an opportunity if you don't mind your AV logs. That 20% figure, coupled with the fact that this type of hunting is fairly easy to do, is another one of the reasons I could confidently say that many of you will find intrusions when you go back home. If an intrusion attempt has progressed far enough along to where an AV product fires, then that is helpful. At best, you have a blocked intrusion, but, there's, but still there may be an exploitable hole in something that needs to be fixed. Worst case is the intrusion is pretty far along, and AV happened to pick up on just one tool in a long sequence of events. Sometimes you get, you get just one shot at finding an intrusion, even if it has been going on for years, and this could be it. Maybe the intruder didn't follow their best practice and make sure a newly downloaded tool or tool update was going to be missed by the target's installed AV. Trust me, mind this data, especially server AV logs, and especially for internet-facing assets. What should you be looking for? Examples include web shells. Look for any type of web shell street names and watch the file extensions. Look for AV detections where the file is under web root or under C colon windows. Look for any detection of any kind of backdoors or any intruder tools identified by your intelligence sources and experience. Look for any bad known AV street names, especially for all malware types that we just discussed. Supplement that with custom HIPS detection with HIPS rules looking for how those targeted malware samples and tools work. Think pyramid of pain. 
If your AV product supports this in some way, even, even with only informational logging, look for packed executables present on servers. So what are known bad AV street names? One example is malware that is known to be targeted from Intel collection or vendor reports. Another source might be AV detections with terms like backdoor, Trojan, shell, web shell, and so forth in the street name. In the real world, some AV vendors are better than others at naming targeted malware samples in a way that is useful for hunting and detection. I can name which vendors are which. No matter what, you might want to consider supplementing your AV detections with a multi-scanner AV solution street names for everything you found in-house. That way, if you use a vendor that who doesn't name malware in a way that is easy to use for hunting or detection, then you can pivot off your AV detections using one of the AV multi-scanners out there to find what every supported AV vendor calls what you found. VirusTotal is one example with API access, and there are others out there. Or you can build your own in-house. To illustrate, you might take every AV detection that you find across your server population and submit all the hashes to a multi-AV scanner and then hunt through the return list of street names for items that stand out. For example, you might not care about games or jokeware detected by AV on your Citrix or FileShare servers, but you might care about a detected web shell or backdoor on a web or database server. Best practice for years has been, and remains, to not submit newly found targeted or, or APT malware samples to such public scanners because you risk leaking intel. But you should be able to safely use a multi-AV lookup for a file hash or a street name over an API to see what other vendors and products call what you found internally. To help fully illustrate the concept of hunting in AV logs, let's break down credential dumpers. The five credential dumping tools I most commonly see in targeted intrusions over the past few years are WCE, PWDump, GSECDump, FGDump, and Mimikatz, in that order. I list some other less commonly encountered dumpers on screen. Find your AV vendor street names for all versions of all of these dumpers and always look for them in your AV logs. Also, if you have HIPS deployed, what HIPS rules fire when these tools are ran? Hunt for those HIPS logs too alongside the AV street names. Next arrow. What are you doing to find rogue network listeners across your endpoints, especially, on, especially servers on the network edges? You could use regular NetStat or a number of other tools. More output fields are better. Just run netstat nabo pull the data back, and mine it. Let's look at some possible benefits. Netstat-NABO can tell you a lot. In this example, data stacking shows more than one process name and more than one path down to the same TCP port, port 1433 for Microsoft SQL Server in this case, on a single system. That is supposed to be impossible. You cannot have more than one process bound to one port or one box or one for one protocol. In this case, intruder activity has, was being interleaved in with legitimate SQL Server traffic for C2. Not good. Consider these. Try stacking the NetStat output for all Internet accessible servers by listening port and see how many ports show up just once across the entire data set. Stack output for all Internet accessible servers by full path to the listening processes binary and see how many paths show up just once. Preserve all NetStat output as a baseline and track new listeners as they appear over time, especially across your internet-facing systems, so that you can see what changes over time. A caveat. There are, these are just snapshots, not real-time monitoring, so you will likely miss non-persistent listeners. For example, when a new listener spins up temporarily based on a timer or as a result of port knocking. Next, user agent strings and HTTP traffic can, can be good for hunting, but please be aware the data set is huge. For stacking, the number of unique user agent strings across a typical production environment can be surprisingly large as well. So to get the most value out of captured user agent strings, you have to filter out a lot to get to the actionable ones. Consider stacking the data by user agent string length rather than content, focusing on both the shortest strings and the longest strings in the data set. Also, analyze the counts of tokens or the word count of the strings focusing in on the lowest uh, token counts. And lastly, of course, bump the entire data set against list, against list of known bad user agent strings. And please bear in mind that HTTPS blinds you to user agent strings unless you terminate that traffic and log it for analysis. A couple examples. Here, first we have an example of what I mean by highly unique low token count user agent. 
See the HTTP browser 1.0 user agent string there in red? It, it is only one token and is highly unique in production traffic. If you see that HTTP browser string on your network, that is always APT and is always bad. Next, we have a user agent string that has a normal token count and normal overall length, but should never actually happen in production, so it should, would show up in stacking. This string, Mozilla 4.0 compatible MSIE 6.1 Windows NT, refers to a non-existent Internet Explorer version, version 6.1. This particular user agent is only found in certain Metasploit traffic. In my experience, I have never seen an attacker use Metasploit for C2. I've only caught pen testers and red teamers using Metasploit for command and control. Next, Windows services are still commonly encountered in targeted intrusions, and have been for years. In large production environments, you will likely find mining your services data productive. Let's explore a few ideas around that. There are a number of tools to dump out a list of installed services. Most of these tools have similar output and show almost everything that you want to analyze for an installed service. Here we show some output from Microsoft System Terminal's PS Service tool. Let's see what fields look useful for stacking and analysis. You want to look for rare, unusual, or typoed service registry names or display names. Those are the top two fields in the example shown. A commonly overlooked field when searching for malicious services is the service description. Some malware tries to hide in a crowd of similar looking services by registry name and display name and file name, but either typos the description field or leaves it blank altogether when the service that it is trying to mimic normally has that field filled all the way out. The binary path name field is a good choice for hunting. You want to look for things running out of unusual file system locations, for example, highly unique paths or file names or anything running out of temp. The example shown on screen is one form of what is known as service hijacking. In this case, the service was something that was already present on the machine that got its configuration changed to point to another malicious executable. For years, attackers have been repointing existing legitimate service configurations to a rogue binary on disk, hoping to escape notice. For legitimate system services, this type of problem shows up when stacking by the right fields. All of your healthy services should point to the right binary path name, or service DLL should point to something legitimate. If you have 10,000 services with the same name and display name, pointing to mostly all the same to mostly all the same file path and file name, and then just one pointing to something different, that should stand out. Now, over the years, Microsoft has regularly changed the names of the legitimate files on disk between OS versions and service pack levels. Despite that fact, one-off malicious service configurations like this one will show up when stacking. Hopefully now with Microsoft releasing fewer service packs and major OS versions, this will be less of a problem for us from a data stacking and hunting perspective. Most service analysis tools, including Microsoft's PS Service tool, don't report on one key field, and that is the service DLL value from the registry. The service DLL value of our service identifies what binary gets loaded when a service is configured to live inside of a shared service host container. I am not aware of a free and publicly available tool that can report the service DLL information. As a workaround, we could use Microsoft's list DLLs tool instead. The first command on screen lists all DLLs loaded inside of any service host process. The second command lists only unsigned DLLs loaded inside of service host containers. This helps reduce the amount of data to analyze, but remember some malware is digitally signed. Recall a bit earlier when we covered hunting for situations where legitimate service configurations in the Windows registry were altered to point to the wrong file on disk? This list DLLs approach helps you find the flip side of that hijacked service coin, Situations where the service configuration in the registry is perfectly fine, but the file on disk has changed. Here, we're, here we are playing off list DLLs U to find unsigned DLLs loaded across all service host containers. The example on screen is showing where the, the legitimate Windows error reporting service still has its correct configuration, but its normally signed Microsoft DLL isn't the thing being loaded. The file name is correct, but the file isn't signed, and it should be. So that should require investigation. When you first start mining services data across a mature population of Windows machines, including servers, ones that have been around for years, you might see things like these unique service registry names and display names bubble out of your data stacking. Service names using only GUIDs are easy to spot by searching for the curly brace characters. Garbage service names are often all lowercase for some reason. 
The commando on screen can help you spot these across your data set. In my experience, most of these are commodity malware, even when found on servers and are left over from days when worms were more prevalent. But you have to investigate each to be sure. Next arrow. Similar to services, Windows drivers continue to be a commonly encountered component in targeted intrusions. We break drivers out here to highlight a couple additional things to look for. The commands on screen are an effective way to dump the driver list, with the best skills for hunting included. To dump all driver info, you can use Microsoft's driver query tool with the option shown in the first command. To dump the sign driver information, you can use driver query as shown in the second command. Here are some sample driver query output from a Windows 10 system. There are a number of fields here in CSV form that we'll cover in a moment. What are some productive things to look for in the device driver's data set? First, the link date field shows when each reported driver was compiled and linked. If that field has been zeroed out or contains an impossible or garbage timestamp, that is interesting. Intruders that timestamp their binaries in the NTFS MFT entries on the file system often do not touch that timestamp that shows up in this link date field. That lives inside of the file itself. So, if you find a driver with file system timestamps that are many months or years older than the file's link date, that could be interesting as well. Next, always examine the path to the binary image of a driver on disk. Look for drivers loading from unusual locations on the file system, for example, any temp location. Does the driver file name itself have unusual characteristics, like the name is all numbers or hex digits? Looking for rare or wrong sounding driver descriptions like the one on screen, monitoring of hardware and automatically updates the device drivers. Mind the display names, looking for the rarest ones in the data set and typos. You might be surprised at how many unique driver names exist across a population, population of even just a few thousand Windows servers. Look for missing or unusual digital signatures on the driver binary itself. Eliminating signed drivers to, to reduce this data set is useful, but please be careful which certs you trust. Some hostile binaries are signed with stolen certs. Here's an example of a device driver that stands out as unique in the driver data set. From a stacking perspective, it is unusually noisy for three reasons. That key IP filter driver name is unique in the data set, as is the key IP traffic filter driver display name. So is the driver file name. Next arrow. Auto runs data from all Windows machines is a productive place to mine as well. Microsoft System Internals Auto Runs is the go-to tool here, with its comprehensive coverage of all known Auto Runs locations, all WMI Auto Start locations, and much more. This one is really easy to do, just collect the data and analyze. It is about 250 to 500 KB per machine. The command on screen will collect everything the Auto Runs tool can find. Auto Runs covers most known Auto Start locations, but not all. For example, side-loaded DLLs and DLL search order issues won't turn up here. Please be aware that you scoop up a lot of non-targeted commodity malware in this net. Not everything is going to be targeted here. Please be aware that the Auto Runs tool can now do virus total lookups as it executes in production, but I wouldn't recommend doing that at scale from your production machines. Do that centrally in a controlled way. Here too, you're looking for things running out of uncommon places, executables at the top of program data, top of the recycle bin, app data, or out of any temp folder location. Reducing the data down to just unsigned entries, meaning entries where the string verified with a capital V isn't present, can help reduce the workload. Look for odd short file names like r.exe or 1.bat. Here we have three examples of malware, malware from Autoruns data. The first popped out of the data set due to the single character exe file name and the uniqueness of the launch starting field. The second and third ones show ways that services and drivers can, st can stick out. In the second example, you have already seen that unique description before. In the third example, you never see a service named Microsoft Cache Service normally across a population of Windows machines, servers, or clients. That entry also sticks out due to its not being digitally signed. Next, Prefetch allows you to get an idea of when certain processes have ran from a different perspective than Shim Cache or AM Cache. Prefetch is a system performance enhancement present and enabled on Windows client platforms from Windows XP forward, including Windows 10. All that we are doing here is taking advantage of another data set that, that Windows already, or already maintains. Prefetch is not enabled by default on Windows servers. Prefetch is disabled by default on, for most modern SSD drives, even on client platforms. 
Up to 128 can be stored in prefetch on XP and Windows 7. From Windows 8 forward, that limit increased to 1,024 entries. Prefetch is stored in system root prefetch. The individual files themselves use a binary format, so you need a tool to parse them. Please be selective in which tool you use to dump prefetch data from your systems. Some approaches that look just at NTFS MFT data for each entry in the prefetch folder try to favor tools that do that and have the capability to look inside of each prefetch file. One quick way to tell the difference between tools is if you have a run count field available in your prefetch output. There have been subtle changes in the prefetch file format between Windows versions over the years, so favor prefetch tool dumping tools that keep up with the latest Windows releases. NERSOFT's WinPrefetch View tool is the one that works. An example of its syntax is on screen. This syntax will dump the output out into CSV file format. Let's take a quick look at what data is available. This is a single prefetch record as reported by NERSOFT's WinPrefetch View tool, ran from the command line with text only output, not the CSV format. See that, that short hash string in red? That's the hash of the file that runs half on disk. For stacking purposes, be aware that hash value algorithm changes between Windows versions. There are three useful timestamps, the created and modified timestamps from the file system, and a timestamp that records when the process last ran. Those are all good for context. The process path is important to help find things running from odd places. The run counter field can help you tell what runs normally on a machine from what ran just once. Now, malware can auto-start and have as high of a run count as legitimate software, but intruder actions like running credential dumpers and issuing recon commands might happen only once. What's the most productive way to approach the prefetch data set? Stack by the various fields that we just covered and consider the timeline. Certain commands in sequence might be a problem. For example, credential dumpers, recon, scan tools, net ping, ran closely together might be a sign of trouble. Watch for short file names in the process exe field especially if the run count is just one or very close to one. Here's an example of an intrusion where we have unusually named prefetch entries in the data set from a single source machine clustered closely together in time. Uh, I think it was seven minutes in this particular case. This was taken from the example that we covered earlier with a w32.exe, w64.exe, and dump P, uh, pwd binaries lived in ccolon users at the top of that folder. As is common across many intrusions from many actors, they have renamed common tools. Because they show up in prefetch, that is further proof that they executed. Next, error number nine. How do trustworthy and reliable outside services that routinely inspect or crawl your internet-facing assets see you? What do I mean by that? One example, Google, as part of its normal internet-wide crawling activities, sometimes sees signs of malicious content on your internet-facing assets. Anyone can view that data by using Google Safe Browsing. In the example on screen, I asked Google Safe Browsing what it thought about the website HackMiami.com. It came back totally clean. Here's an example of a website that Google didn't consider clean. For sites that you own, if Google knows about a problem that makes that data available to you for free, why not mine that data? In my experience, Google Safe Browsing has a very low false positive rate. Now, when Google does find something wrong with a site, that doesn't mean that is a sign of targeted activity, but I think it's still something you would want to know about. I just want to take this little deviation for a second. Now, in my experience on the target intrusion side, you know, this sounds like you're just going to go find once you lower this, this fields for a second and got an exploit kit or something and you upload it to the site. But and in my case, I see from certain actors from multiple countries where They'll keep pro probing the edges of your network over and over, day after day after day, looking for just that one little configuration change where somebody made a mistake, the little configuration back, a vulnerable hole, and they punch through. It's a, that's why I think this is good. It's a good technique to find, even though you have to wade through a lot of um, kind of noise, which is like a commodity, like a mass um, opportunistic type of like exploitable web, uh, web face the asset. <clears throat> All right, so back to Google Safe Browsing. Google provides an API for doing this as well. Instructions are on the link on screen. Basically, you apply for a Google API key. That API key allows you to programmatically submit requests to safe browsing, including giving you the, the ability to bundle, bundle up to 500 lookups per request. Any sites that Google safe browsing thinks have an issue, return with the string malware in the response body in HTTP status code 200. Sorry. Otherwise, you get HTTP status code 204 with no data. 
Full details are on the links on screen. Here we show you how to perform a scripted check of all your websites using through Google Safe Browsing. Do this only in compliance with Google's Terms of Service. The first step is to take your entire domain list and construct the full URLs for WGET. That's the first blue command on screen to help you do that. Next, we query Google Safe Browsing using WGET. That 10 second wait guarantees that you cannot go over the current default of a limit of 10,000 lookups per day. The results will be written to disk, one file per check. If you check 1,000 domains, you get 1,000 disk files with the results, one per domain. To find any problem URLs or domains reported back, you search for the files returned using the command shown on screen. That just, all that simply does is spit out the list of files that, that match that file, file mask with a star, API key star, that are bigger than zero bytes on it. But those would be the ones that Safe Browser doesn't like. If you like the idea of using just one URL scanner, why not many? There are a number of effective URL multi-scanner services out there. A multi-scanner approach lets you take advantage of the strengths of a range of URL scanners in one action. Now, I try to keep every recommendation in this talk restricted to things that you can do for free, but most of the URL multi-scanners require payment of some sort for API access. The most popular ones are normally very easy to use and have very clear documentation to follow. Most work by issuing the requested URL or batch of URLs in a single HTTP post, and you get the data back in an easy-to-parse format like JSON. On screen, we have high-level steps for doing this. Just a couple of tips. Don't force a new scan on your first pass. Just read what might have already been saved over the years and accumulated by the URL multi-scanner over the years for your organization, for each domain and URL that you have, for every scanner supported. Most APIs for URL multi-scanners do have a way to force a rescan. Do that next for all your domains, which you've collected all the historical information that that URL scanner, multi-scanner has. Strictly adhering to the site's terms of service and your API key limits. Next recommendation. Consider mining your NTFS file system MFT data across your Windows systems. One thing to look for there are entries that are normally have empty extended attribute fields that now do have data in them. Extended attributes in NTFS are a way to store extra information or metadata about a file, information that isn't normally part of the file system's bookkeeping. Most files on an NTFS file system don't have anything in the extended attribute fields. It is normal and acceptable to use extended attributes if need be, but unfortunately, some high-end malware authors have adopted a technique where they might hide some hostile content and ex extended attributes as well. How can you find that activity? Here's one technique. First, you need to grab the raw MFT from each Windows endpoint. In the example on screen, we show you using HP Gary's fget tool to do that. The MFT is locked on a running Windows machine. For newer Windows versions, fget doesn't work anymore, so consider something like raw copy, as shown on screen with its download, download link location. Next, chop the raw MFT into usable fields. In this example, we're using analyzeMFT.py for that. The download link is on screen. This step provided us, provided us with a CSV file with the MFT parsed nicely into fields. Locate the EA and EA information columns in the CSV. Reduce the data to only include rows where either of these fields show as true, one or the other, or both. What list out what is normal in your environment to further reduce the data and analyze what's left. When you reduce the data this way, it goes from huge to a much, much, much smaller manageable percentage. Things like Windows WinSXS or Windows CSC can normally be whitelisted. You will see patterns of normal across your machine population. Analyzing what's left after whitelisting goes out. If you do find something requiring further analysis, you need to extract the contents of what the EA entry points to. Great work has already been done showing ways to do that. On screen are two links I recommend for full details. If you need to extract any data or contents from an EA entry, you have to do that on the source machine or from a full disk image taken from the source machine because the data contents likely won't be in the MFT file that you extracted. This isn't always high-end APT malware. It can be things like advanced cybercrime malware, but it's worth mining. Next. How might you find if a high-end adversary shoots a zero-day error at you and it sticks? One that has never been seen before, a true zero-day. This is one tough problem. This is more in the realm of, of a PhD-level attacker bringing in their A-game versus D-to-F game activity. Most of us have to depend on catching something later in the kill chain, but we can try to catch the exploit in some cases. EMET log mining might be one possible way forward. What's EMET? 
EMET stands for Microsoft's Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, and it's a set of mitigations that you can add onto Windows to help protect against a range of exploitation techniques. It is most commonly deployed on Windows client platforms and works for protecting most against most everything except Java runtimes. EMET works on Windows Servers 2 from 2003 Server Ford. EMET logs, EMET logs go on the Windows application event log. Basically, if EMET sees something is wrong, it takes whatever the prescribed action is and records that in the application event log. Not everything EMET logs is zero day. You might encounter bugs or misbehaving applications that cause EMET log noise. However, you might be able to find use of zero days there, looking at what EMET has blocked. If you see where EMET mitigated or killed iExplore.exe or Office or your AV product and your machine is fully patched, that could be a bug or crash that looked like a problem to EMET or it could be a thwarted exploitation attempt. You should know when this happens. Here's an example from July 2015 where a high-end APT actor was phishing using one of the Adobe Flash Zero Days leaked from the hacking team dump. If you rolled EMET out with the EAF mitigation enabled, then EMET blocked their exploit code upon execution. The blue text on screen is what EMET logged in this case. EMET detected EAF mitigation and will close the application I export at EXE. In that case, that uh, Flash uh, exploit was a uh, use after free. If you didn't find this fish attempt another way, this could have been your only chance to know an attack had been attempted. If you roll that EMET across your Windows clients and or your servers, EMET log mining should be an effective zero-day detection method for you. Next, our twelfth and final error. Consider proactively pulling back Windows RAM dumps from select systems and processing them. Maybe it is too much to attempt to all your systems due to the amount of data being collected being multiple gigabytes per machine. Maybe focus more on pulling RAM dumps back from key systems, internet-facing systems, or the ones you're most worried about for one reason or another. For example, interesting machines from new company acquisitions. RAM dumps have many more nooks and crannies in which to look for anomalies and signs of intrusion, but it is a huge amount of data. The good news is that you can script RAM dump analysis to an extent with tools like the Volatility Framework. First step, how do you get the RAM dumps? There are a variety of tools available, most work similarly, and many are free. However, almost no Windows RAM, RAM dump tool collects everything where malware can hide. For example, video RAM and device memory ranges. Try to select RAM dumping tools that can reliably and safely collect everywhere that malware can hide. George Gunner's KNT tools is an option. Hardware dumpers are another option, but those are a bit more costly and intrusive. There are tons of useful data to mine in these RAM dumps. We will just highlight one special case here. What are you doing to find BIOS or firmware implants across your server and client hardware population? This is another tough problem. Whether we are talking about system board BIOS or firmware, or firmware and hard drives, or supporting networks of graphics hardware, we are currently at a pretty lopsided disadvantage as responders and defenders. Implants in BIOS or firmware typically leave little to no detectable trace. But we need to do the best the current state of the art allows us to do, right? For example, the Art of Memory Forensics book, Citation and Authors listed on screen, has some interesting suggestions for detecting certain types of BIOS and firmware implants. One suggestion is to check the real mode interrupt vector table for signs of tampering. Another is to check the uppermost addresses in real mode memory for any traces of an implant. What's on screen was taken from a dump of physical RAM from a 32-bit Windows 7 machine. Using the same technique on a 64-bit Windows 7 machine works fine as well. The real mode interrupt vector table normally starts at offset zero in physical memory and runs for 1,024 bytes. You can tell if you're on track if you see a repeating four byte sequence there. Those are pointers to interrupt handlers. The first four bytes store the handler for interrupt zero, the next four bytes for interrupt one, and so forth. This command syntax shows a, shows a way to generate a more structured dump of that same real mode interrupt vector table in a format easier for data stacking and analysis. That command will list all 256 possible interrupts in the table with the address of the associated interrupt handler. The addresses starting with F000 normally point inside a standard BIOS. The C000 ones are normally video BIOS and so forth. You're looking for what isn't normal here, what could have been tampered with or hooked by an implant. The second suggestion from the authors of the volatility book was to inspect the uppermost addresses in real mode memory for any traces of an implant. Here I suggest you deviate a bit. If you have indicators, strings, and byte sequences that you can use to detect a particular BIOS or firmware implant that you care about, then I believe that it's better to scan your entire RAM dump, including what you captured from real mode memory. 
That sounds more thorough to me in case any indicators leak outside of real mode address space due to how the implant works. Also, it is better to search the entire physical dump file as a binary blob in addition to the structured searches using tools like volatility that may be checking only process address space or kernel space depending on the circumstances. So, do you, do, doing your structured searches in volatility with the TR support is effective for this purpose, as the examples on screen demonstrate. But also search the whole RAM dump file for the same indicators like any ordinary binary file to make sure that you cover the entire physical address space. A third suggestion from the volatility book for hunting for implants is to see if something called the IO APIC indirect access registers have been tampered with three route interrupts. APICs and IO APICs are just pieces of hardware used to support processing of interrupts on multiprocessor systems. I don't have a scripted volatility command ready for this one yet, so I will instead show you the manual steps to get this data using the Windows kernel debugger. The output on screen is from a 32 bit Windows 10 machine. The process goes like this it's real simple. You either have to convert your RAM dump to Windows Crash Dump format or collect it in Windows Crash Dump format to begin with. Then open the Crash Dump file with the debugger. In this case, I'm using the command line KD kernel debugger, but WinDBG works just as well. I issued a .log open command to save the contents of the session to preserve the IOAPIC command output. And then you just type bang, bang IOAPIC to dump the IOAPIC data out for later comparison and analysis. The idea being to look for deviations from normal in this data set for example, where an implant might be reporting one of these addresses for its own purposes. Lastly, a few closing thoughts. Get the noise out of your environment. Intrusion hunting is difficult and tedious enough already, so whatever you can do to avoid spending time on commodity malware helps. First, toward this end, deploying Microsoft EMET helps a lot. It's 2016 now, and the latest versions of EMET are fairly safe and, and, and production worthy. You won't destabilize your production population too much, as, unlike the problems we have with you met back in the old days. Uh, patching, basically the Microsoft operating system, MS Office, plus Adobe Flash, Flash Player helps. There's another helpful thing that you can do that might not be so obvious. Automated fish cleanup. Some of your spam and fish protection vendors have a feature where if you have an inbound fish affecting 1,000 mailboxes, and that vendor lets in, say, 70 in before it starts blocking them after it realizes the fish are malicious, you still have not... The, the, 930 got blocked, but you still have 70 potential clickers or victims in production. Some vendors provide an API that you can use to see that 70 got delivered and before the blocks happened. The idea here is to take that list of 70 fish that leaked in and trigger auto-removals, deleting the fish emails from users' mailboxes automatically. For those with Exchange environments, Microsoft Exchange, Microsoft, and Microsoft has an easy-to-use API for this. Doing this should help reduce the noise you have to deal with when hunting for serious intrusions, even in the most secure networks. This Microsoft API just takes message ID, recipient name, it's real simple. You can get like a SIM feed from your, from your Fisher AS spam vendor to give you that, at least that much information. You should be able to make this work with under 100 lines of code. Next thought. After working on new intrusions in post-mortem, think carefully about exactly what could have, could have alerted you to the intrusion earlier as well, as well as long as every step of the intruder's path. Add to your hunting process as required. Go back through your entire case history, all historic intrusions, and do the same. What well, could have found that intrusion earlier or more reliably? When you read about intrusions affecting other, others in vendor reports or in the news, mentally do the same. Could your organization have found that intrusion earlier on your own? Be consistent. Convert as much of your manual intrusion hunting processes to automated detection as possible. Managers, please fund your hunt functions and don't back off just because the volume of intrusions found might be low for extended periods of time. It is tougher out there now. And finally, stay vigilant and keep elevating, raising the quality of your detection and response processes always. I would like to thank you for your time and would like to now open up for any questions if we have time left. Uh, the uh, AM cache we were talking about before. Yep. Uh, they, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Mir pulls back AMCache, but there's no, re there's no reason to go and not use it, because <laughs> that company you mentioned, the vendor for that, is acutely aware of the, of the value of Shimcache and AMCache. So. Yeah, it's, but the Shimcache and AMCache don't require some vendor. It's this yeah. Microsoft bookkeeping. Um, 
Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to trivialize that part of it. I was just trying to go to lay out a number of really simple sets of data that work for that paid off in my experience for finding intrusions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, the gentleman's question is how well do, do tools like Microsoft Security Essentials and I think Macu is the other one work? Um, where I work, I cannot, I cannot praise a vendor or disparage a vendor, so I cannot answer that, sir. It's an excellent question, of course, but I'm not allowed to say that here. I, I, I just can't. It's a, that's a minefield for me. It's a great, great question, though. Anyone else? All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much.